My name is Kinvara Balfour, and this is the fantastic Zach Poson. Hi. Good evening. I am very honored to be here with Zach today. He's an incredibly busy man. He's an iconic fashion designer. His designs are sold all over the world. He designs countless collections every year. He is a, becoming quite a superstar chef as well with his cooking Instagram posts, which more we're going to talk about. He's a star of Project Runway. And he also has three dogs called Betty Blue, Tina Turner, and Candy Darling, which is probably the best thing about him overall. So we are going to start Candy talking Darling's to Zach. You share. Oh, good. I'm you like share Candy. Good coloration. Good. That's good. Actually, I was kind of hoping to be more like Tina Turner. She's a bit of a role model for me. Yes. So welcome. Thank you. And thank you for taking time out of your very, very busy schedule because I know you are really up against it right now with it's, Fashion Week. It's coming Fashion up. Week, so it's more of a good morning. Right. To me. Right, okay. So before we talk about your fashion, your upcoming show, I actually want to talk about the Emmys because you've just returned from LA. You had a seriously successful time. Tell us how that works out. How does it, wow. is it enjoyable? Is it terrifying? Is it fun? Do you get bored? What's it like? Okay, well, this year I went with Heidi. So it was definitely not boring. And it definitely uh, brought my experience to a whole other level. Uh, Heidi is an international superstar. Right. And, you know, I think that she is right now, especially like a princess of NBC. Okay. And it was NBC produced. So I, lo I liked seeing how really well treated my friend was being and, you know, and yeah. handled. And, you know, that was really cool. Right. to see an experience. I did the Emmys the year before, and I brought a friend of mine who had never done a red carpet, who hadn't had her first film come out, and we had a blast. Her name was Gia Coppola. You should all go and see her film. It's, it's on demand. It's called Palo Alto Story. And okay. that was a different experience. Right. Because when you bring somebody, then I can become the guardian or the power publicist mode. And in this situation this year, it was just very, you know, it was Heidi and I front and center, and she is beyond one of the most professional people I've ever met in my life. I mean, I don't think I would be able to multitask if I, mean, I haven't had the children. three years of watching her on Project Runway and learning right. from her, and also how she interacts with the media. I mean, they just adore her. And what's the... What's There's the a graciousness. Of... Yeah. Um, I... Now... You learn something every time, you know, you work or collaborate with a different team. I knew that I wanted to put Heidi in that dress, uh, you know, pretty shortly. I didn't know if we were going to go together, but I knew that if that was like a perfect dress for her. Um, you know, I like when I see Heidi when she comes to my studio, when she's no makeup, when her hair is not done. And she's naked, judging by your post on Instagram, which is lovely. I would be lovely. naked too if, if, right. if, if I were Heidi Klum. Right, I mean, exactly. She's, she's <laughs> All the time. She's fashion show ready. Yep. yep. For real. Um, and how do you... Um, but she did smart you... things. Like, she did the photos first. Right. Skipped all the press. Did yep. the photos first so you look fresh. And then you have about an hour and a half of press... Well, I was going to ask. So, I left my so house at twelve in the morning. Yeah, in the boiling sunshine, ready to yes, go in your tux. It's hot, and you know, yeah. the sweat starts to creep from the back of your head over the, you know, makeup. But it's an and amazing no experience. And no one's feeding you or doing anything, right? They You're have just... little fans. Okay. And they have these uh, water bottles with these very—I don't know if you've seen these at parties where they have these really strong plastic straws that okay. are almost dangerous because if somebody hits, you know, it's like <laughs> a weapon. Star. And how do you... Um, but we had a blast. How did you get ready together? How do you prepare for something like that? Are you going to be eating a huge meal beforehand? Are you jumping well, around cooked. the hotel room? I mean, I cooked the day before. I okay. cooked it. I really was excited. I love produce and vegetables. And so I was in California, which just has exceptional produce. So my priority on my morning off was to go food shopping. Okay. okay. My de-stress. So I, you know, I cooked that and I had that prepared. My, my protein, okay. nothing too salty. I was wearing um, a custom-made Brooks Brothers tuxedo. Uh, I just wow. took on being the creative director of their women's brand. Yeah, congratulations, by Thank the way. You. That's fantastic for them. To you. come in the future. I mean, we're still working on it, and you know, yeah. it's overseen 
everything from image, advertising. So you're going to be display. creative director, am I I'm right? I'm creative director. Yeah. So it's I oversee a team. Brand. It is. Yeah, it's such an iconic brand. But I think for me as well, coming from England, it has that iconic status, but it, it will be exciting to see what you do. Yes. Very exciting. Classics. Yeah. Redefining the classics. Right. So back to the Emmys, I want to ask, so you had quite a few people in your grounds, and it's such a cliche of a question, but I really, really want to know. How do you, as a designer, work out who's going to wear your gowns and, and who actually ends up wearing them? And how do you feel if you've put so much time and work into something and someone doesn't wear it? Or is that just the, the, the nature of the That's game? That's par for the course. Okay. I started going to Los Angeles when I was 21. Um, I'm 33 now for Oscar week. And so I was a kid, you know, I would do whatever I could to make it work there. You know, I didn't have a PR company. I was pretty social as a teenager in New York, so I did know people, but it was a whole new world. And so from that time on, when I started getting people, I started training my teams into celebrity dressing. Celebrity dressing was just forming. Right, I mean, that, that wasn't totally, there were celebrity stylists, but you know, that sort of becoming the Rachel Zoe effect hadn't happened yet, and it was just happening. I remember we presented a collection in a hotel, and it was day two, a full day of press, and Rachel was the last stylist allowed in. And she said, please, 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 will you lend me a dress? And I liked her, she was so driven. I mean, I like driven people, people you know, that have a mission and a plan and are gonna get it done in my studio, in the work, in my collaborators, I choose actresses that I like their performance or who they are. That's who I dress. Um, they is, can be trendy the and I'll take that into account mm -hmm. or cool at the time, but I really have to have some kind of personal bond. So like Anna Chomsky, yeah. I love Veep. I love the show. Right. She's great on it and you know, okay. it's my girl. And Lena Dunham. And all Lena these, Dunham. All these well, I didn't dress Lena Dunham in, in, the, in that thing. Yeah. But um, okay. I fixed her. I tried before I pulled down the shirt, <laughs> before she went out. You know, you just want everybody. It's such um, a high energy uh, moment. You know, it's hard for me to separate and be the performer. Like, I'll want to fix the hem. But, you know, of the course. one text I got from my boyfriend is like, if you fix her hem, <laughs> it's going to become a cliche on the carpet again. Okay. But, okay. you know, there's certain things you see. You know, you just want everybody to have a good time, especially people you care about. Mm -hmm. um, but so you have a stylist coming to see... The stylists start contacting us the second the images are online. They put pieces on hold. We okay. decide whether we put them on hold or not. Uh, it's an incredible, like, square dance. Mm -hmm. Things fall out. Things come in. You know, it yeah. moves. It keeps moving up until the last minute. Zippers break. Yeah. Something falls out. People get insecure. You, nervous. People get insecure. I've had while. I, one day I'll write an LA book experiences. I mean, I have to say, I think um, being an onlooker for all of it is it must be absolutely terrifying the amount of exposure that one's getting and all eyes are on you. That no matter whether a dress is perfect or not on a hanger, that if you're just not feeling okay in that dress for five minutes. That's the end of that, right? And you've put all the work into it, but there's no guarantee someone's going to wear it. Well, you're putting yourself on a bigger stake than presenting in New York Fashion Week yeah. or anywhere. That is, it's so highly visible yeah. to such a wide audience. I mean, I truly believe that if you put integrity, care, and love yeah. into the dress to the, from the beginning and through the process, maybe that's a little bit of me being a control freak, that it will <laughs> transcend into the wearer yeah. and communicate uh, to all the people around the world viewing it, I also wanted to start bringing messaging, mm -hmm. like we do with a fashion collection, into the red carpet. Okay. You know, we'd come off of the Costume Institute Met, which the theme was Charles James, and so we were really playing with large volumes and grandeur. You really stole the show on Thank that you. one. You really that was did, fun. quite rightly. Those gowns are amazing. So I wanted to take the carpet into direction. You know, we've had our fishtail moments. We've had, you know, all these moments which are standards. I mean, my experience on the red carpet was, wow, is our stuff copied okay. everywhere. I was like, whoa, really? that's the back of that dress. Oh, somebody just sent that to, 
XY factory and yeah. rubbed it off and did it in another color, but yeah. that's par for the course that's as the well. That's the price of success, I'm afraid. Soon you'll be in a Zara. So I wanted to change shop. it. I wanted to do clean, I wanted to do soft, and sort of an effortless look, mm -hmm. especially because of the heat. Yeah. And is the runway, is the red carpet as important as the runway now for a designer, would you agree? Because Depends. I, I mean, that's very specific per people. In okay. terms of visibility, um, I believe so. I mean, I don't think you're, you know, I think runway is extremely important. You know, not all runway collections have red carpet appropriate clothing, and that's great too. That has its very strong purpose, but we're living in a larger world now. And it can give, it can make or break, and it can give good exposure or very bad exposure. I mean, when you have a bad dressing moment, that does have effect. When you have a good dressing moment or a sensational Heidi Klum moment, mm. you know, that can change your sell-through worldwide. Really? Worldwide? Yeah. If we have a good episode on runway, I can correlate it into my bag license and different levels, and that, that, that makes it fun. I mean, that's like the nerd alert side. <laughs> okay. I love that aspect of following it and then being able to like clear all of that out and get creative and hands-on in my process. Okay, so talking about the process, so you have your, your Spring Summer 15 show coming up next mm -hmm. week. And tell us a little bit about what's going on back at the studio. How do you, how do you create each season? What's your design process? Well, it changes. I mean, processes evolve and change and you learn from your own team and experiences and it also changes within what resources you're working in or have allocated. Um, we are very streamlined. I would say we're very frugal for a brand that celebrates a level of grandeur. But I think that's, I don't, I think that's fantastic and I think that's a sign of fashion today for everybody anyway. There is a, a, I certainly as a consumer want to know that the company I'm buying the clothes from has been frugal to a certain extent. Short of recycling what my granny wears, which a lot sure. of people are telling us to do. We I commit. Actually, it's I about want commitment. luxury, but frugality Okay, well. but if you can commit to a concept and an idea, and yeah. you go with it. And the other thing to note is that when you're building a collection, or any part of fashion, it is collaborative. I have an incredible team. Small team, but an incredible team. And uh, I also work with my partner. And so the vision is very clearly planned out. I mean... Two months ago, we had our run of show. From okay. photos, what we do is we do multiple hour draping sessions. So I get fabric and understructure, and we start to build the shapes. You know, safety pins, tape, whatever it takes to achieve the look. And this is on a mannequin in the studio? No, on a, on a person. On a person. And some on a mannequin, too, okay. that I do. That's when I have my solo time, right. when I pump my music okay. and go. What music are we going to listen to? Anything. I mean, it depends what is of What's the moment, okay. um, you know, if I really don't want to be disturbed, then I'll like put on something very methodical and classical. If I want to lure people in to bother me, then, you know, <laughs> you put Techno. on like Motown's greatest hits. I okay. don't know, you know. Right. Um, and you have a mood board for every season. We do. And that mood board is a result of the mood you're in, films you've watched, holidays you've been on. Everything. I mean, everything, everything comes into inspiration. It can be from going to a vegetable market to pulling references. I mean, we're living in a time when things are referenced of the reference of the reference. Um, I don't know if you all read, there was a great piece I thought that Kathy Horn wrote in T Magazine two weekends ago okay. on Hetty Sleeman that was very interesting to me. Right. But okay. anyhow, you know, about referencing and that, that sort of culture now. Mm -hmm. um, but we put together our mood boards, and then we do, on each piece, multiple fittings of perfecting and perfecting, and we choose our colors. We start with the fabrics, then the colors, uh, then the techniques that we develop in our studio, right. and then we apply them into the pieces. I mean, you are a real, to me, a real architect. I know you went to Parsons, you also went to St. Martin's, which is an incredible fashion school in London and has produced some of the most incredible designers, John Galliano, Alexander McQueen. I mean, the list goes on and on and, and the on. The teachers are still there. Uh, that's amazing. Most Although of the I teachers. will say, rest in peace, peace, Professor Louise Wilson, who was an incredible woman. I knew her personally and she sadly just passed away and that's, she, her legacy is great. She was a force of nature. 
Did you, was she there when you were there? Of course. I was in the BA master's course. Oh, yeah, because you're so MA, young, I forgot But now. you're still on the same floor, and I would do the modeling for the students who were in the master's. Okay. So I'd always be in her fitting. She just pulled me in. She's amazing. You know, she was amazing. it's a school where you don't have classes. So you get yeah. projects, and then you get publicly critiqued yeah. in front of your whole class, and they'll break you down. I mean, that's part of it. Yeah. You know, the halls are full of tears and booze. Yeah. And were you, influenced, were you influenced by the likes of McQueen and Galliano? I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons I was drawn into fashion. Yeah. Uh, they hit a note in the 90s that really changed fashion. Uh, there was a level of fantasy and romanticism. I think it comes out of, obviously, both of them have a countercultural, had, it, had it have a countercultural uh, quality to their work but there's extreme obsession with technique, history, and craft, and the reinterpretation of that, mm -hmm. and the magic of where fashion can go. And I really believe that, especially with John Galliano, that the modern luxury brand, from a business standpoint, was built in accordance to the level and talent of his creativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they're, you know, I think they both, in different ways, uh, had a passion for the female body. Mm -hmm. As do you. Yeah. Yeah, thank goodness. I'm glad someone does. And the process that we're talking about, for me, I, I really, really love what you're but doing. But that's why I moved to London. Okay. I mean, I moved to London because those were the designers that I was really drawn to. And when I was a student, I would intern here at the Metropolitan Museum, mm -hmm. and I got to meet my heroes and work with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Alexander McQueen, I remember, walked in and smelled me. Really? And kept walking, and I Did was he? terrified. I had gone to London to apply to St. Martin's, and I had bought this sort of tech jacket called from this brand at the time that was really doing sort of a predecessor, I think, to the Rick Owens look now. It's called Vex Generation. Okay. And it was sort of, you know, zip up hood, you know, so I looked like a samurai, and it looked like a bug, like a tech bug. And I was wearing that, and you know, he recognized that and he sort of smelled it and then kept walking and, and John and his team, I've never seen anything like that. I remember his assistant in right time, uh, his assistant at that time was wearing really the cut of his uh, bias gowns, but it was made in a muslin heather jersey and she had Princess Leia buns walking through the halls of the Met changing like from six languages and Amazing. I thought, wow. That's what a muse is. And then they invited me to lunch, and I would, you know, these are the heroes. These are the people. They are the greats. I was living for at the time and, yeah. you know, in awe of. Yeah. Well, the process that you talk about, you display very, very well on Instagram. For me, I'm very interested to see how designers have embraced Instagram, for example, or social media. And you, I love it. I'm, I'm actually developing a TV show about Fashion Week to show the process of how fashion is made in a very respectful way similar to what Project Runway does, which actually re really respects the process of fashion. People are fascinated by process. Yeah, and I think the number of people who are involved in making one dress, for me, is all those people should be, are, should be and are so respected and work so incredibly hard, and it's such a collaborative effort. But I just want to talk about your Instagram now, because you're, it's so brilliant, and I want to confirm, like, you're the, you post everything, right? It's yours. Oh, yes. I, and I, I love post how and erase share. things. <laughs> Any comments that are like homophobic, racist, yes, those go, and totally. they get blocked. I, there's some crazy people out there. We've all, yeah, it's I, I'm yeah, experiencing it Any kind of discrimination, more more. judgments, yeah, delete, blocked. Have you have you found that the um, engaging with the right kind of fans for you ge actually generates equity for a brand? I mean, you're very active on social. Well, media. that's an interesting question. How do you derive? media hits to equity. Because yeah. at the end of the day, business is business. Yeah. Profit is profit. You know, so when you take something that, uh, I mean, this would be the time that you want that evaluation while social media is at this high point. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, well, we can sell stuff off of it. I mean, there's no click and buy on Instagram yet. Yet. I mean, it can't wait for that. I'll there's no, there's a few things that I don't understand that I'll just put out there. Yeah. Like, why aren't there, maybe there are, but I don't understand why there's not emojis with a brand name on it. Well, why can't you just... You can make that. I can... I don't know. Like, why doesn't... Well, I can put it, you in touch with someone who can make that. That's the future. Carl Lagerfeld did do it with his cat with Choupette. 
That's not what I, I mean. I wanted to say like Chanel. Yeah. In their logo, like yeah. why doesn't that pop up? Yeah. And also, why can't you click through to web links? That really upsets me too. It's okay. all coming. It's all going to happen it's at some point. The happen. commerce part is more of an interesting equation. Whether you know it can link you to a site to buy it. Yeah. I mean, you can have that, but you want to be able to click and buy on that image. Click and buy, buy those shoes. right now, those ball gowns. I want those ball gowns. Well, that works. I mean, Moda Operandi yes. has a real serious business with yes. our gowns. So when you're, um, but if, for me, in the olden days, not yes. so long ago, if you wanted people to know about a gown, or you're launching sunglasses, or you're doing your Truly Bridal, Truly Zach Post yes. it is with David's Bridal, all those things before, you had to rely on a journalist on a publication in order to convey that to your audience. I've done a lot of tap dances. Right, right. But now you can convey that directly to your customer. Yes, so that dialogue is... It's direct. Very powerful. Yeah. And it's viral, and it's international. Okay, so I want to ask you, as someone, because you are so dynamic and so enthusiastic and incredibly nice... How important to you now is the press? And I mean this in a respectful way because I, I believe that they all have a place. But now, what are you sending to the press that you're not putting on Instagram? Do you do, you, do, you, do you double up? Do you replicate? Or are you doing something different There's as a designer? There's different purposes for messaging and getting information out there. Okay. Um, you know, the press is a trained authority and an eye. You'll always have that. And this... The, in, the, uh, the internet has given the ability for a lot more opinions and people to self-certify into this. Um, but I think everything eventually levels out. I, I believe cream settles, you know, at the end of the day, and you, I think you're seeing it. The serious bloggers rise and their, their voice is more respected. Mm -hmm. But it's, it must be amazing for journalists to see that separation. I mean, the one thing I could say is that I wish that some of the very senior uh, establishment of journalism would have been a little bit more uh, embracing of the new generation. Mm -hmm. I think that there's been a lot of um, emphasis for designers to, to do this, as competitive as we all are. And we know it's fashion, so age is a tricky situation there. I mean, we mm -hmm. fashion likes fresh, new, and young, and disposable, yeah, squeaky clean squeaky all clean. the time. But I think that that would have been nice to have seen. But I think that the serious journalists retain that voice in terms of to the consumer, maybe not so much as it's been. Yeah, that's different. Yeah, it's the changed. consumer also, though, as opposed to listening to the other people that are giving information on the internet, the consumer has transitioned into making their own decisions. I mean, we are, we, are, we are critics now, all of us, aren't we? We all have that power and we all want to be critics. Yes. We're all very vocal. Well, it gives everybody a voice, which is a very beautiful thing. Yeah. It can be yeah. a dangerous thing, but it can also be, I mean, it's an incredibly gratifying thing. I feel like with the process of being on Project Runway and that exposure, where my company was, where I was personally, and using Instagram, that it really educated uh, the world about my process and my brand and who I actually was, as opposed to maybe in the past how press had perceived me to some degree. Yeah, and I, and I love that, and I love your Instagram. The other thing I love on your Instagram is cooking with Zach. Hashtag cooking with Zach. If any of those, any budding chefs here, your, your company must be the happiest company in the world because they, must, they just get fed with cake and pie every day made by their boss. I mean, what more do you want? This week it was tomatoes. Okay. I just bought yeah. bushels of tomatoes in. So from you, this is another kind of very important creative process. I'm really worried that we're running out of it's time. It's okay. Though. I'll talk faster. Okay. Sorry. And then we also have time. For, we have to do Q&A. But tell us about your cooking because that's such a big part. I, I feel like my it's a TV de -stress. show. Is my it like a cooking show? Like a gentleman farmer thing? No, I, no much more... I watched something on the internet with you with a, with a French chef. It was so, so Eric French. Repair. Yes, he was so French. That and was... you managed to cook and do a full interview in pretty much French. I was very impressed. Thank you. So you love cooking. I do love cooking. Right. So I was a very depressed middle school student. Okay. And I watched a lot of cooking TV. <laughs> um, okay. And read a lot of cookbooks. Okay, well, it's good because what you're making is pretty complex. Baking... Cooking, yeah, all of it. Yeah. That's when I go home 
And because my partner and I work together a lot, it's like his time to watch Canal Plus, his French news, and my time to get in the kitchen and do something creative. I need to work with my hands every day. So if I'm doing interviews or if I'm traveling, like that's just so bonding and humanistic to cook. I think it's about the most generous thing you can do for somebody. Yeah. Like, you know, it's nice to get a great present, but to cook for somebody, I mean, that's really, it's a bonding. I mean, I think there are things that are important is like mm -hmm. family, food, friends, and, fashion. and then fashion. Yay. Oh, God, I have so much to ask you more, but I think we have to open up now for Q&A because we only have five minutes left. So if there's anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question, raise your hand and... Should I choose or you choose? You choose. The lady in the white. And then we'll just wait for the microphone. Thank you all for coming tonight. I hope it's sad to say. And you guys have to check out before we say, I just, we just put online, I think it's on style.com right now, our Zach Zach Posen collection. Oh, right, yeah. This is your sister line. My sister line, yes. exactly. Love a sister line. Stylish sister. And you, and you, um, you displayed that today. You had a presentation. We did. Today. So I was in. So we styled that this weekend. We shot it on. What day? Anyhow, in the last few days, we shot it. I shot it on uh, a really beautiful model, uh, Harriet. I saw her on Instagram. Um, and um, that came online. And then so like today, I was started at like at the studio at eight. 30, and we started doing the walkthroughs and the press previews. So you have to walk your journalists through, and then right. the images go up, and then I can Instagram. Like, th that's an example. I respect my journalists and publications that I won't publish the images before them. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, these are, it's all collaborative. Mm -hmm. You really, there's no reason to have to piss people off. No. There's just, it shouldn't be that way. Our, the industry is too small. And it happens, but you really try not to. No reason. It's just a waste of energy. I think the Sorry. person least likely to piss anyone off is Zach. So I can be good spicy. Him. Yes. No, I won't. <laughs> OK, question. Hi. Um, my question is, um, I'm a blogger and very ingrained in the blogging world. And I'd love to know how the growth of the blogosphere has had an effect on you and your business. Well, it's had a huge effect, especially in accessories. I think things that aren't uh, fit-oriented are easy to write about, to focus on, for then the consumer to find it. Uh, I think that, um, I mean, bloggers have been totally essential for me. I mean, they get the word out, they pick up on it, it's a dialogue. I think with the collaborations and works that I've done with a lot of the models that I've worked with, I mean, Coco Roche has walked every show in her whole career. I'm the only designer there when nobody believed in her at a moment. Crazy people. And I knew it was there, and you know, that consistent uh, collaboration you know, built. And then it, you know, it was like very strategic, like through the internet, it was gonna build her into like the sensation and, and to build her into a brand. Um, so I think that that's one part. And I think that uh, just the communal dialogue is essential. And it's great. It's just become something different. It's become fashiontainment. And that's what it is. As well as people purchasing the clothing and buying it, brands and the intellectual property itself um, just become an entertainment source. I mean, people, not everybody, many people, most people can't afford our couture gowns. But it becomes, you know, we do these dancing videos, and that becomes its own mini piece of art for that moment. And it's spontaneous, and then it can get picked up. So it's very important. And I think it's important for bloggers to really establish identifying looks for themselves. It's like essential, you know? Like, and the editors, you see them, they've become their identity. It's really important. And also to be really individual and stick to your point of view and voice. You know, the last thing that would, I would think is needed for bloggers is for it to become all vanilla. You know, and also to make sure that the system, you know, that has changed our industry, which is the control from advertisers, and everything, that, that, that with bloggers, obviously that will seep into that. 
I mean, if you have a blog and you want to take advertising, that's going to affect, you don't want to lose it. So you don't want to say, ooh, that bag that season was nasty when they're your banner on top. But I would say keep the free voice. Keep your voice pure as much as possible. OK. Thank you. Next question. Uh, you choose. Oh my god. We'll go from the Whoever's, back and we're going to move yeah. forward. Back and forward. Just so I know, how much time do I have? Someone? Anyone? You, a little bit. OK. We, can, we have time. Okay. That's okay. good. Ten, five minutes. Hi, Seven Zach. Minutes. Hi. <laughs> um, so as a couture designer, I was wondering how you, or when you decided to sort of go more mainstream with David's Bride, with uh, David's Bridal and things like that and your more um, affordable collections, uh, you know, outside the of mass just, dish. Yeah, the mass market and all that, yeah. Um, I, as a human being, integrally uh, am generous in spirit. So to me, it was just getting to a certain age, a certain understanding of a larger business, uh, to understand that that is what was going, it was going to need to, to, I was going to need to expand in that way uh, from a business standpoint and uh, just from an ethical standpoint. Like women, if there's lots of women that are drawn to something, why shouldn't they be able to have something that has some essence of it or, you know, like with the David's Bridal line, I'm actually draping those pieces in the fitting. I'm redrawing. I treat that process. They have their own more mass production process, but I treat it like I'm in, in our, one of our collection fittings. I chop, I redraw, I redrape on there, and I'm sort of fascinated by seeing how then that gets translated into an entirely all-white, fully suited white factory somewhere else where they make these pieces. Um, but licensing is essential. I mean, there's a few models in fashion that you can do, but to think that you could support yourself by just making a collection level clothing, and I would say even now an it bag, doesn't exist. That's not going to make the business side happy. Fashion loves to drink blood. It is a, you know, this is the reality. They love. The, the, you know, and, it, and it can be, it's very expensive to be in fashion and keep it going. However, I tell lots of people, have, you just have to decide on what are your ambitions as a designer, where you want to take it. Um, because you can have a smaller boutique couture store where you make one of a kind clothing, you know, and then you have to be okay with that is the lifestyle you will be living. And I think that's a beautiful thing. It's sort of each to their own. Um, but in terms of the expansion, it's something I've always was planned in 2001. And you know, you live through different timings and when things are right. Um, but I really believe it's important to be able to have a larger voice. I have a message that is about loving women, that's about loving your body, that is about promoting the beauty of diversity and uh, in general about happiness that creativity can bring you, or experience, or glamour. And I wanted that message to be heard really loud and clear. It's not what I felt necessarily from the whole industry. It's in parts of it. But it was something that was very important. And I knew that that message and who I was and my personality had a larger voice to be heard and a larger audience, so that's what I wanted. I wanted to make women feel beautiful and happy of every size, and uh, that's, that's what that was about. I mean, with my David's Bridal, we go up to a size 32 in gowns. It's also and really they're under, affordable. Like a, yeah, it's they're really mostly affordable. under $1,000, and There's they're amazing. There's a navy one I have my eye on. There's Which a navy, one? it's like navy strapless. Oh, that's the best-selling style. It's that amazing. just keeps going. It's like $1,300. That I like, too. I like when it's cookie-cutter. Right, and it's not really bridal. Well, in England, it's, America is different. Everyone wears lots of different colors for weddings. In England, it's very much white. So those kind of gowns are perfect for parties as well as weddings. Yeah. Like, please don't stop on that front. Okay, we have a gentleman in there. In the plaid. 
So uh, the buy button on Instagram is, I think, one that we've all heard before. What are some other things that the, you're surprised? Sorry, the what? The, the buy button on Instagram yeah. is one I think everyone's waiting for. What are some other things that you're surprised don't already exist? And what can AOL do to maybe help make those things possibly exist? Good, good, good question. Well, I think there's a formatting issue. I think there's a little bit of an issue between formatting of scale of video. Drives me nuts. I mean, I learned recently that you can just pull it down or you can insta-size. But that tech, I don't know. I don't think that should have to be a whole second app and process. That's one item. Obviously, the buy now aspect of it. Uh, personalized emojis, I just don't under, I mean, can you draw a face and then that becomes your personalized emoji? You have to go to a lot of tech companies and do it. Well, that I don't under, like, it's that's. expensive. Yeah, I don't even, you know, I'm putting that out there. Right. I and tried to, to think about how I would develop that and I keyboards. thought, eh. Yeah, we're going to do Only one so you. much time in the day. Yeah. Um, other aspects that I think online, um, well, I think there could be a higher level of policing of like, you know, I don't know. It, I think it's, an, it's like, I don't know, it reminds me of like the early stages. I grew up in New York and like when Cablevision came to New York and all of a sudden there was all this access to new information and it must have been like when radio happened and all, you know, you had little kids listening, you know, too late at night into there. It's sort of the same. I mean, I get nervous about memory retention, but I mean, these are not things that I can't, nobody can fix that. But, you know, you don't need to have a memory or really be an expert on anything because you can Google it. So people's memory retention patterns are changing. Um, but what's great about that is it leads people to further research. And I think like that is so beautiful. I mean, people can really delve in, express what they like, and research it now. I mean, there's so much more fast information at our disposal. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of other elements that I think. Longer video. Longer video, of course. That's, yeah, that's, you know, would you want smell-o-vision? Maybe, maybe not. If, yeah, maybe, yeah, that's a I good idea. Know. Um, in addition to Instagram, what talking are, emojis. I mean, maybe they have the, you know. Oh my God, this is so exciting. Exact talking emojis. This is what we do emoji. in meetings in our office, like That's the great. brainstorm. Um, what other apps do you use and love, as well as Instagram? Well, I have so many photos on my phone, and obviously there's been all kinds of iCloud issues recently. Um, <laughs> my entertainment team that I that I work with, I got all like this weekend all these emails. I was like putting all my photos on iCloud, and then that panic like or all my photos that I found out what was happening in the world. Um, so I don't have that many apps at the moment. Okay. But that's because I just have no memory. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and now I like have to erase. Yeah. Um, you have to do second step verification. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Um, but I do use, obviously, InstaSize and InstaVideo. Um, okay. I'm pretty purist. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I would just be on them all the time, so it's better that I don't have it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question at the front, and then we have time for one more, and then I think we have to go fast. Um, so, I was just wondering, um, when did you really know that you wanted to be like a fashion designer? Like, that's what you wanted to focus on, because like I'd like to do that, and I just want to know. So it's yeah, <laughs> it's a great question. Well, I think my love of clothing and fashion started really young. But it wasn't the first thing when I was young that I wanted to be. I didn't order. I wanted to be a song and dance kid. I mean, I wanted to be on Broadway. I trained to dance, to sing, all of it. And that's what I did. And that was my focus in my life. And at the same time, I was always making small maquette theaters and making the costumes for, for and always doing performance in the house. And costume was a big part of it. And my dad is a painter and an artist. And funny, if you research later, his work dealt with fabric. It was photorealism in the late 60s and 70s, and it's all draped fabric. So things just you know, become hereditary. But when I got to high school, my first year of high school, and I stopped going to uh, musical theater summer camp. Uh, Wait to see the photos of all this. Oh yes, the um, and they're all all those people. You know, it's like Adam Levine and Zoe Deschanel. We all went to camp together, so it's a whole crew in L.A. You know, the competitive other musical theater camp of those actors. Yeah. Um, at that point, it was time to get a summer job, and so it was like 
get a job and I got an internship uh, on 7th Avenue at Nicole Miller. And that was sort of hitting the ground running. I don't know, I felt independent. I had gone to Parsons for a summer course at that point. And I got to high school and I had fabulous girlfriends. Really, that was it. I had girlfriends that were supremely stylish, uh, that were definitely in the center of the scene at the time. And they were very inspiring. And I was wide-eyed and a mouthful of braces. <laughs> you know, and you know, I'd wear my Century Twenty One things that I would find and put together. Were you wearing Were you wearing really quirky clothing? Oh yes, good. I had really hideous John Fluvog platform shoes. I'd wear sailor trousers that I got at the flea market. They would sit like people say my pants are really high right now. They were like up to there as a teenager. I'd wear ivy in my hair, and it was a whole look. Ivy in your hair. It was a look, and I would take Lena Dunham on the subway. And we had a whole rapport with our subway car every day. We would catch the same commuters uh, on the NNR train to go to Brooklyn. And we had the same train car every day at the same time. And it was the commuters from the PATH train down to, to Wall Street. So that was our fashion discussion every morning on the train. And, so fun. Uh, she would do the weather for the, of the day. What was she wearing? Crazy stuff. Crazy clothes. Her mom for my 16th birthday gave me one of my favorite pieces of clothing I ever got given. And it was a costume uh, from uh, Madonna's concert. And it was the Jean-Paul Gaultier. Uh, Stop it. Yeah, it was the monk outfit. It was like a hooded blazer. <laughs> you know, it was brown with the V there and the hood. Wow. You know, and I just thought I was like, so street. Yeah. <laughs> in my, in my Gaultier couture. Okay, so Lena Dunham's mum gave you Jean-Paul Gaultier outfit from a Madonna concert. I hope you and still a, and, a, and, a, and a cookie of Eloise. That okay. was Lena's gift. And okay, she that's has even it, like, better. And tattooed on her now. I hope you've kept the monk outfit. I, I have it. Yeah. I just, because he just had a big retrospective in London in the Barbican. Yeah. I mean, his well, he's work a great designer. Amazing. Anyhow, so I wore crazy outfits and I had great girlfriends. And the girlfriends were working in fashion already at the time. They were, you know, interacting and modeling and I was making them clothing. I was making all the girls around me clothing. And I would go, my school had a small costume shop in it. I went to a school called St. Anne's and I just made stuff there. I, sewed, I started sewing at six. My mom loved craft. She was um, in the business world, but you know her real hands like craft she loves. And, and that's when it started. And then started interning at the Met and I interned at a company, Toka. Um, and you know, every experience you meet different people and learn different processes. I mean, that was the first time when I was at Toka, the samples weren't made there. So it was like we were designing or overseeing or a sample would come in wrong. I remember I once burnt a sample and thought it was just like I was dead. Like I, they needed those Swarovski crystals, heat transferred through the double cashmere. And I was just like ironing, ironing, and then suddenly it was like <laughs> shh, through. And I was mortified. Um, but you know, you learn. We were developing the candles at the time. They just discontinued Fraca, which was a tuberose fragrance. And it was like, tuberose, tuberose. I must have been really You must have smelled good. Annoying that little kid, like intern, <laughs> tuberose, tuberose. <laughs> Do a tuberose candle. Right. But you just learn. And then I applied. I had a crazy decision, because when I went to high school, I became really academic. I was real like questioning, even in very progressive schools growing up whether my ADD and dyslexia could work. Like really, was I gonna be a kicked out kid out of school in the most progressive schools in like lower Manhattan, uh, you know, as hippy dippy as it can get. And uh, I got to high school and I had such amazing teachers and it made sense. And then it was just, they were so supportive of how I could incorporate what I loved and what I was doing into it. And I had to make a big decision not to go to an academic university. Um, or design school, and I applied to St. Martin's, and uh, I got accepted into two parts of the school, into the foundation year, or into just go right into the program. And I was 17 at the time, moved to London, skip a year of college. I was there, you know, and I was much younger than everybody, and London was like a big petri dish for me. I could like explore and learn it. Um, you know, have all of my Aristo fantasies fulfilled and that, you know, just experience from the rock and roll scene in, in the UK and the icons of that. And when I was 
there is making clothing and, you know, word of mouth happens. If you dress enough people, something's going to hit. And if you're a girl or a woman and make your clothing, you better be wearing it every single day, seeing what the reaction's going to be. Uh, and then my next thing is start small. Don't need to do a big blowout line. Like focus on what your voice and what you want to make is specifically and own it. And repetition is reputation. So just keep doing the same thing for a little bit. That hits, then you surprise them with the next thing and you have a staple that becomes just a seller. Be consistent, be persistent. Yeah, you have to be, and be patient. He, he wants the mic. He's not being patient. He's not being patient. Should I mean, we take we have, one we more? Have to, yeah, we have time. One more. We've gone way over, but that's, I don't care. One more, yeah? I'm okay. You choose. Oh my gosh, yes. She was waiting, so we're gonna have to take hers after. I feel bad, I skipped you twice. Yes. Ben. Hi. Hi. Uh, as an emerging designer, how did you create your first business plan? And what was a little bit of that? Wow. Well, it was very, very naive. I mean, I thought I knew a lot about fashion. I didn't know anything. And my mom, who I brought in, knew a lot about business. So that being said, we learned this together. Trial and error. Because your mom is, works with you, right? Just Not anymore. Not my anymore. mom is on my board. Okay. But I worked with my mother and sister for years, and they really started my company with me, and I brought them in, you know, sort of a man, a plan, a journey. Um, you know, business plan was, first of all, you know, I didn't start with investors. I started with air and interns and lemonade money. That's how I learned profit margin. My mom had me have a lemonade stand on Spring Street, four quarters equal a dollar, take off 50% of that is your cost of goods. That's how I learned the premises. It's all the same. You have a product, there's costs that go into it, there's the time of the selling it, and there's your rent. So you're left with 20 cents. Okay. Anyhow, well, but the business plan, I mean, start small. You know, it will evolve itself. Uh, I think, you know, I was lucky because of timing. We had, I had clothing left over that my girlfriends did not want when I was in London that I brought back and retailers were sort of interested in, there was word of mouth. And at that point, a retailer said, we just want to buy it. The fashion director came, did an impromptu fashion show in their living room. And we didn't have a way to finance it. We didn't know how to do production, anything. Uh, there, were none, there was nothing that facilitated young designers at this time. And uh, what we asked for at the time was 50% on order, which is unheard of. And they did it. And that, with that money from a sketched collection, I said, you can't buy this. I can't do these fabrics. These are from like the flea market in London. And so I sketched a collection, went to the local stores, put fabric on hold that I would know I would want to do production on, but I could release. And you took that, and then you have to hustle into the factories in New York, find a small pattern maker and a, and a hand to sew it. And that's how we funded it. And then 9-11 happened, and so everything stopped. But then, you know, out of something tragic, the industry, I felt even stronger that it needed uh, a very positive, powerful message. So it's just sort of timing. But business plan, I mean, I will tell you that most businesses in fashion will, are surprisingly unprofitable on the clothing part of it, which you probably all know. But uh, so it depends on what you want to do. It's so specific. But you know, I give a lot of advice to people on business plans all the time. I enjoy that side, too. That's what makes you so successful. One. Um, her. I promised her. OK. <laughs> Sorry. Then. No, no, no. AOL is in charge. Our oh. video's up. The video's yeah. up. The Insta <laughs> videos. Yeah, speaking of your cooking stuff that we spoke about earlier, so I know you came out with this apron a while, a couple of months ago. Oh, that was just a gift I from know. an assistant. Yeah, but everyone is asking you on Instagram if you were going to end up 
selling that apron at some sort maybe of, and you said maybe so is it gonna happen soon or maybe something <laughs> i'll I send you moved, an apron yeah i just moved to london that's why and i'm exploring cooking so i've been watching your yeah. instagram listen i think you know the cooking thing it all is about timing and pace and obviously when there's interest you want to jump on something it's really for me time delegation would i love to be able to have a cooking show of course. I love that rapport. I'd like to be able to develop that development. At the moment, I don't have that time. I hope to really soon. Um, you know, is that something, it's very authentic, it's very real. I can write my recipes. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe a different component of it. Maybe it's narrative storytelling with recipes. I think that could be interesting. Um, it's something I'm exploring at the moment. But product development off of the cooking thing, not yet. That will come after. You have to sort of create the Bible for that world first and that brand because it's sort of its own thing. But I just have fun cooking and I'm glad that so many people enjoy it and it seems to have inspired a lot of people to take great pride and joy in cooking and display and you know it's like a whole dialogue, pages and pages of people trying to do. And I also think what's important for me with the cooking thing is a healthy balance. Like, eat healthy where it's important to eat healthy and be decadent and indulge where it's okay to indulge in food. Because people have weird things with food. And I don't, you know, I think especially in the United States, it's really important uh, to eat healthy and to try to eat clean foods and unprocessed and to cook at home. It's just healthier and more enjoyable. It's fun, it's a process. Okay, well. On that note, I want to thank wonderful Zach for coming along today. You're the best. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming as well. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, and Kim. I have, I have to say, I have an iPad with notes. I have not looked at it once. Like, you are fantastic. You're awesome. I think thank we have you. to do like a Who Wore It Best with Heidi, <laughs> the short edition. Please, let's not do a Who Wore It Best with Heidi Klum. Please. <laughs> thank you very much for my beautiful dress. It is beautiful, and I'm my sad pleasure. to take it off. I'll see You're you at the amazing. show? Yes. Okay. I will see you at the show. So, thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.